Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series, which is now being broadened to include topics on beef, lamb and goats. My name is Cordy Cheers and I work with the webinar coordinators um, tonight, Holm Sackett. The series comprises of a total of 30 webinars that will be presented by its completion, in, which is in July 2020. These webinars are recorded and they will be made available on MLA's website. The title of tonight's webinar is Feeding Weaning Cattle for Production or Maintenance, which will be presented by our guest speaker, Ben Lynn, who's of the McKinnon Project. So just some housekeeping um, tonight before we get started. For those that aren't familiar with the webinar platform or need a refresh, the control panel that you can see to your right is able to be opened and closed using the red arrow so that you can enjoy the full screen view during the presentation. You should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. So I'd encourage you to use the chat box in the control panel to communicate any questions that you have during the presentation. Please make sure that your questions are as clear as they can be so that I can address, or Ben can address them with relevant responses. When you log out of the webinar, a survey will pop up for you to fill out. I'd encourage you to all take the time to fill this out. The feedback we receive from this survey is important to the continuation of the webinar series as it allows us to assess whether we're hitting the right topics for you. Um, so to kick off today, I'd like to introduce Ben Lynn, who is a veterinary consultant with the McKinnon Project, a sheep and beef consulting group operating out of the University of Melbourne. The McKinnon Project provides veterinary, agronomy and whole farm consulting services to, the cl to clients throughout Vet Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. Prior to joining the McKinnon Project in early 2019, Ben worked with the APM Animal Health as a veterinary consultant to beef feedlots and piggeries across Australia. Some of Ben's primary in interests as a vet include improving whole farm profitability and management of intensive animal health and production. We're very fortunate to have Ben presenting on this topic today. So with that, I'm going to switch over to you, Ben, if you're ready. Yep. No worries, so that should all be live now, hopefully. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction there. Courtney. So yeah, we'll fire off into this because there's a fair bit to cover in this um, in this topic, and um, yeah, I think to be fair to, tonight, I'll try and do as much of a uh, an introduction to this and, and cover as broad a base as possible. But it is quite a quite an in-depth topic. Um, so just kicking off now. Uh, so the topics we're going to go through tonight are: um, should we be fanning weaner cattle for production or maintenance? Um, and into that comes, uh, can we rely on compensatory gain? And we'll go into that initially uh, and what that is. And then cover heifers and steers and how we manage them uh, individually. And then just at the end, we'll run through a little bit of a case study and, and give a bit of an overview of um, ration formulation and things like that just very briefly. So back then, with um, whether or not we should be feeding weaner cattle for production or maintenance, um, well, there's a few things we need to consider first. Um, one is the time of calving. Uh, being that uh, whether we're an autumn or a spring carver um, in this situation, um, autumn versus spring carving will depend um, on whether our calves are, are weaned onto a lush green pasture or into a dry environment for uh, spring carvers. Not that there's anything wrong with spring carving. Um, most of our analysis says it's a generally a more profitable um, uh, um, system uh, just from the ability to run higher stocking rates. Um, but yeah, you do tend to wean, uh, wean a cattle onto uh, rougher conditions. Then looking at your region, um, northern versus southern regions, so slightly different management strategies. Um, and tonight we'll focus predominantly on southern systems, but um, there are some applications there too for northern systems. And then just having a look at your uh, target market and what you're, what you're targeting to sell to. Are you keep keeping your heifers yourself um, for rebreeding? Are we uh, selling our, our steers as weaners? Are we selling as feeders or villas? Or are we finishing on, on the property as well? So just initially, I thought I'd touch on compensatory gain and, and what that is. Um, and, and, and the reason why compensatory gain is so important in uh, cattle production is that maintaining a consistent growth rate throughout the year is really difficult in, in a grazing situation. 
um, up north, we've got a wet season and a dry season. And then down here, we've got, you know, uh, late winter and spring, flush of green feed and, and dry conditions in, in summer. Um, we have this variable quality in rising in fluctuation in pasture. And what we often see is if we have a nutritional restriction period on a pasture-based system, say uh, down here in, in, in summer and, and going into autumn, and then in the dry season up further north, we often actually see this rebound effect, uh, which is faster, and rebound effect in growth rate, which is faster than we'd actually expect. And, um, and this is called compensatory gain. And that then begs the question, do we actually provide supplementary feed to our weaners during the dry season and then keep them growing at a high growth rate? Or do we just say, right, we're going to cope with a slower growth rate or no growth at all, and, um, and then let them catch up through compensator again when, when pasture availability increases? So like I just said, why don't we just supplement in the summer, summer months and dry season? Well, that's because sometimes uh, if we get subsequent compensatory growth, um, if we've restricted them from this, uh, from this period, we actually end up eroding any benefits we might have had from supplement free feeding them during this time. So they can catch up to where they should have been when that uh, flush of grain feed comes through. So we can almost do ourselves with a double whammy there if we, if we do feed too hard in the summer, in that we can spend a hell of a lot on, on significant feeding expenses and they would have just caught up anyway. So then it's, it's a, it's, it is a difficult topic, but, but what does affect compensatory gain? And it's hard to measure. Um, but generally, the degree of animal maturity at the start of feed restriction is a big player. And that is that the older the animal when that feed limiting period comes in, uh, the faster the, the rate of compensatory gain. Okay, so, so an animal prior to weaning that's had a feed restriction takes a lot longer to respond than, say, an animal that's had a feed restriction four months after weaning. So there we go, just a rule of thumb. The earlier the restriction, the more difficult it is for the animal to fully compensate. Okay. So there's a nice bit of work done on this, which um, looked at all the studies done on compensatory gain and, and the timing of compensatory gain and how long it took for animals to get back to 70 to 80% of their live weight. And I found that cattle that were exposed to a feed limiting or a feed restricting period where their growth rate was slowed at less than six months of age, took around about 14 to 18 months to compensate to 70 to 80% of their live weight. Whereas cattle that were exposed to a feed restriction at uh, older than six months, so you know, typically going on to weaners, more into yearlings and things like that, actually only took four to seven months to, uh, to catch up to uh, 70 to 80% of the, the rate they would have been at. So just as a rule of thumb here again, nutritional restriction pre-weaning isn't good. However, post-weaning can make it easier to manage. And this is an area of the presentation where we're just going on a little bit of a tangent because it's where the principles of early weaning uh, really start to apply nicely and it, and it shows you the benefits of early weaning. And so this is just a bit of a side note. When do we early wean? And um, for most of my guys, we, we like to early wean when the body condition scores, so the average body condition scores of our cows drop to two and a half uh, out of five. And from this, we know that um, if we have any further loss in body condition, we're likely to have more compromised reproductive performance. Okay. The age of the calves, look, uh, typically in a dry season, we'll reduce down to 100 days if we have to. Ideally, we'd be around about 120 days. Um, and that's purely because the, the earlier we wane calves, the higher the crude protein and metabolizable energy we need for a supplement, so it's more expensive. And there's also just a higher health risks with a younger animal that's uh, not as immune competent. And same again for the weight of calves. Ideally, we'd have a minimum of 120 kilos for, uh, for early weaning, but often it's about 100 kilos. Now, just as a side note, um, there is an extra feed cost if we wean too early, if we pull the trigger too early. So if our cow condition score is good, our herd hasn't dropped down to or below two and a half out of five. Um, and, and we've got sufficient grain feed on the ground, then we can actually um, increase our cost um, due to supplementary feeding post planning. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. So this is just a new, little bit of analysis I did a while ago, um, looking at the economics of early weaning. And what we have here in the first two areas of this table here, we have a calf and a dry cow that's weaned at four months. So probably a month uh, earlier than normal down here in a nice season. And then we have an unweaned cow and calf unit over here on the right hand side. So we can see here, if we're supplementary feeding these guys, what I've done is 
for these guys here, I've modelled that we don't want our dry cow using, losing any weight during this period. And we want our weaner growing at about 600 grams a day, so a pretty reasonable growth rate. For this unweaned cow calf unit, I've also said I want to have this uh, calf growing at 600 grams a day. However, um, to keep this uh, calf growing at 600 grams a day, no matter what I throw at it, this calf is, uh, this cow is going to be losing 310 grams per day in condition. Okay, so that's the unweaned cow and calf unit. And if you have a look, what I've done here is I've applied a fairly, um, a fairly decent supplement here, um, of just, just oats and silage, pretty basic mix, just to give the required crude protein and energy for, um, for the weaner to keep going. Okay, and our total cost of supplementary feed per unit per day for stable growth rate on this dry cow and to keep this weaner going is about 97 cents a day. Whereas to keep this weaner growing at, um, or unweaned uh, calf, growing at the same rate, at the same age, um, we, and, and to, to limit the body weight loss for this cow to 310 grams a day, it's going to cost us $1.18 in supplementary feed a day. So we're saving ourselves 21 cents per head per day in feed costs, which doesn't seem like much until we look at it and we say, across a 500 cow, cow herd, we're actually saving ourselves a bit over 100 bucks a day. Plus we've got the added benefit here too of our dry cow not losing any further condition. And so she's going to have better reproductive performance. Anyway, that's just a side note of early weaning. I thought we'd better cover. So now we might just crack into uh, some post weaning feeding of um, heifers and steers. So I'll start with heifers. So how should we be feeding our heifers post weaning? You know, do we need to be feeding them for production? Should we really be trying to punch them up at you know 800, 900 grams per day of average daily gain, or can we cope with you know 300, 400 grams per day of growth rate? So the main thing here is we still need to hit our key targets for heifers, and that is our critical mating weights at, um, at 15 months of age, so joining, um, which is about 55 to 60% of mature body weight. So for a 500 kilo mature cow, we want to make sure that these heifers are 300 kilos at joining. That'll give us our um, first calf down at 24 months. Now let's say in a scenario, where we wean this uh, heifer at 120 kilos at four months of age. To hit that 300 kilo mark at 15 months of age, she needs to grow at about 540 grams per day, okay? So 0.54 kilograms per day. However, the big thing I'd say for heifers is that we don't need to follow a steady curve for growth. We can restrict this growth earlier and then speed it up later when we have a green flush of feed come through. And just, it's just to show this, um, there's a couple of studies I've just listed here. One was a study done out of Kansas State um, where heifers were split over two, into two groups. And this study was conducted in two consecutive years. And what they had was one group that just had, a, had an even gain from weaning, for, so for four months post weaning, five months post weaning, they grew them at about 450 grams per day. And then they had the late gain animals and to hit the same body weight here, they grew them at, um, only 110 grams per day from weaning to 90 days after weaning. And then they really ramped up their growth rate to, to simulate the similar sort of green flush of feed. And they really ramped up that growth rate for the next 70 days. And what they found was that in year one, there was no difference whatsoever in any, any measures, whether it was conception rate, pregnancy rate, calves on the ground, um, age of puberty or anything. In year two, the only difference was the age of puberty, so the age of when these uh, heifers first came on heat. There was, however, no difference whatsoever in, uh, in their conception rates, time at conception and age of when the first calf was dropped, okay? And then just to, uh, just to back this up again, there was another Canadian study I had a look at, um, which split heifers into five groups, and that was, they, they manipulated the feed intake, not only of the dam, so of the mum, before the animals were born, but also manipulated our pre and post weaning levels of feed restriction. And what they found here too, was that even when, uh, even when the mum, so when the dam had a restricted feed intake and, and restricted condition calving and, and reduced milk output, they found that um, despite this, they had a slight delay age, uh, in age of puberty, so age at first heat. However, all of their other reproductive measures and calving performance, the social levels um, and, and uh, conception rates were not impaired by this early feed restriction, okay? So the take home message from these two studies are that growth checks at a younger age in heifers 
can be corrected to a large degree by compensator again, okay? So we can get them to the right weight for me. So a little bit different than steers. And just the one final bit of work that I'll show you, which is quite interesting, is a study that was done a while ago now in uh, South Australia. And it looked at the effect of different levels of, um, different levels of feeding from two to eight months of age and eight to 14 months of age. So the first one here is a high feeding from two to eight months of age, followed by a medium feed from eight to 14 months of age. Okay. So these high feeding guys, from two to eight months of age, they were fed at 910 grams per day of average daily gain. So pretty high growth rates. These medium guys, they were fed at, um, they were fed at uh, 670 grams per day. They're still quite a high average daily gain. And the low guys are around about 550. Then from uh, then they manipulated the, the, the average data gain. So then they have a high low group, which gained 910 grams per day from two to eight months of age, and then only uh, 140 grams per day from eight to 14 days. And similar again, they had animals that were initially started low and then were fed high, high volumes of feed. And then we have animals that, um, that initially started low and then were fed medium and high volumes of feed. Okay. So what we can see here is this earlier feed, feed allowance really gives us a much heavier weaning weight in these heifers, okay? And our medium guys, yep, we're about the medium and the guys that had restricted feed are a much lighter weaner, okay? But if we put these guys on a medium, a medium level or a high level of feed post, uh, post weaning, then they really start to crank up and pre-mating, they actually hit some pretty high numbers. So you can see the guys here that started high, had a good, and then dropped down to a medium rate. They had the highest pre-mating weight. The guys that were medium, they, uh, they, they, they stayed pretty stable. And then the guys that were fed uh, a, a limited amount and a low amount pre-weaning and then fed a high amount from eight to 14 months of age, they actually compensated a lot of that gain. And this was reflected in their calving rates too. Because we managed to hit these heifer pre-mating weights, you can see there that our, our calving percentages are all above 90%. And they're the ones that are in red. If we compare that to, uh, to the ones that had uh, a reduced mating rate, where we end up uh, reduced mating weight, sorry, we end up with a, a calving percentage between 75 to 85%, okay? So the critical thing here is hitting that pre-mating weight. For heifers, it doesn't matter so much as to when the growth restriction occurs, okay? So just those key points down the bottom again with the same table above. Heavier heifers had better conception rates, so heavier heifers are joining. Heifers that had good pre-weaning nutrition had less dystocia, okay? So the guys that were fed harder from two to eight months of age had lower levels of dystocia. However, what we do see with these guys is they did have a lower milk yield, okay? So they did have a 4.1 and 4.9 milk yield compared to the guys fed harder, uh, lower uh, pre-weaning, uh, which had a 5.9 and 6.1 litres per day of milk yield. Um, for me, if your heifers are very well grown, they're probably highly uh, more likely to have a fatty udder thing with, uh, with that uh, rapid accelerated growth, which results in that reduced milk yield. Um, however, I do tend to find it's a bit more overrated and, and, and the more, Bigger bang for your buck efforts on, on uh, profitability are going to be calving percentage and dysplasia. If you really are struggling with milk yield in your herd and you're finding that your, your um, heifers are too fat around, uh, around uh, calving and that's reducing your milk yield, then there can be a consideration for um, culling the top few off as, as vealers. This is generally only applicable though to guys that are stocked relatively conservatively. Okay. Now, just moving on to steers, and this is the one where, where there is often the, the most discussion about. Um, and, and the one thing with steers to, to always establish first is, is what is your target market? Are you, are you feeding for a weaner or a veal or sale? Um, or are we feeding uh, in a feedlot environment or finishing on pasture? And, and the reason why this is so important is this then dictates how much we can restrict feed our steers, okay? If we're selling into feedlots and selling as feeders or finishing our own, We've got enough time for compensator again to occur, but if we're selling weaners or vealers or, or selling not too long after weaning, generally got insufficient time for compensator again to occur. So we really need to keep those pre-weaning and post-weaning uh, growth rates just smashed up as, as high as we can. 
The other important thing to consider here too is one, your sale price per kilo, and to do the maths on that, and two, also your commodity price and how much it's going to cost you to feed these animals. So I think CRC did some good work on this a couple of years ago. Now, I think it's early 2000s now. Um, up in Rockhampton, where they, they got a group of Belmont red steers and they, they split them into three groups uh, for 120 days after weaning. And these three groups were a rapid growth rate at 810 grams per day, a slow growth rate at 300 grams per day, just under, and then a weight loss group where they actually lost 220 grams per day post weaning. And then what they did, they killed subsets of each group at the end of that 120 day feed period. And then another 192 days after that, so your typical feeder, feeder market entry point, and then 600 days after that, so your typical uh, finishing and, and, and uh, sale point as well. And what they did here, they not only measured performance and growth, but they also measured meat characteristics. Now, for most producers here that aren't uh, finishing their own cattle, we've, uh, the, the meat characteristics aren't as, as relevant. So we won't go too much into that tonight, just in the interest of time, although there is a lot of information on it. Um, but what we can see here is this top, top line in the chart here, that's our rapid gain group for that first 120 days post weaning, okay? Then we've got our medium gain group that was gaining about 290 grams per day post weaning. And then we can see here, we've got our weight loss group here. That we're losing around about, uh, 220 grams per day post waning for those first 120 days. So what you do notice is that um, in this trial anyway, we get this brief window um, in the weight loss guys where we can uh, we can see that we get a slight rise in our, in our um, average daily gain. So our rate of gain is slightly higher compared to these guys here, which have a, have a more horizontal line or not as, not as vertical line. So we've got a faster rate of gain in these weight restricted animals. After that though, so about after another 120 days after feeding, you notice that they just tend to flatline and they always stay below. So effectively, depends on your target market, but if we're looking at our animals here, we say, well, weight restriction is never gonna pay, okay? So I'll just show you. So here, so average daily gain was not was a, was not different for the entire period after that 120 days, aside from the weight loss group, uh, who who, uh, who who gained at a slightly faster rate here, as we can see for the first 120 days after. Following on from this, we can see that they're all sort of flatlining. Okay. So at current at current market prices, if we do you know, have our weaners losing weight post weaning. We end up at this end of the scale being 50 kilos lighter than our rapid cattle here. And at the current market price there with a 51% uh, dressing percentage, yeah, we're looking at around about 166 bucks less per head for the rapid guys compared to the uh, uh, compared to the weight restricted guys. Now we need a we need to weigh this up against the uh, the cost of supplementary feeding these guys, which was not done in this trial, but we'll go into a little bit later. And we can see here that just our steady plan of nutrition guys immediately post weaning, you can see you can see here they're actually not too significantly different here. So often just maintaining that steady growth rate in your, in your steers post weaning, depending on commodity price of course, will actually end up with you um, reaching a similar carcass weight as a finisher animal and also as a feeder animal when you're entering into a feedlot. So just a few charts here as well from BCRC stuff, which looks at the effect of a low birth weight. Um, so let's say 10 kilos less at birth um, compared to a, an average birth weight and, um, and restriction in this stage. So if we have a low birth weight, even if we have the same pre-weaning growth path and everything like that, same feed available, we end up being about 25 kilos lighter, okay? Then you can see here at grow out, we fall further behind. We're 40 kilos lighter when we hit that feeder market. And then that keeps falling further behind. So 55 kilos less as well. Okay, so and that's at 30 months of age. So what we see with this, if we have a low birth weight, so below our target and below our average, and that might be from a nutritional restriction in the uh, last trimester of pregnancy, we see slower growth to weaning. So they're a bit lighter. We see reduced feedlot performance. They don't grow as well. 
this line isn't going as well. Our carbs don't catch up in weight. However, what we do find is there's no adverse effect on our carcass composition or eating quality. Okay, so that's a little bit of that eating quality stuff I was going into before. So the big things I'd say here is there's no or limited compensation here during backgrounding. You can see our line's actually a bit flatter and that gap widens from 25 to 40 kilos. And we also have an older age at onset of puberty for our heifers. Now generally, uh, like we went into before, it doesn't really matter too much if our heifers grow a little bit slower, as long as we're hitting that uh, critical mating weight by the time of mating at 15 months, which is 60% of your mature body weight. So just looking at another one, let's say we have a scenario where we have um, a bit less rain during our spring calving and we have less feed available and we have less milk production and we have slower pre-weaning growth, okay? So you can see compared to our target here, of we've got a light, slightly flatter line here. So we've got slower pre-weaning growth, okay? So we end up being 70 kilos lighter at weaning. And then we track up and we see here, we see actually a bit of compensation here. We, we're growing at a faster rate than, than, than our average year. So we're starting to catch up a little bit. And this, this is what's called partial compensation. So you can see here that we start to catch up. We narrow the gap from 70 kilos to 35 kilos, but we don't completely catch up. And then we end up 40 kilos. So pretty well flat line from the finishing stage. So what we see here is some compensation during backgrounding. Very similar feedlot performance and average daily gain. Um, but what we do see is we don't actually catch up in weight. Um, but going back to the eating quality again, we don't have an effect on composition of our carcass, so dressing percentage or anything like that. And we don't have an effect on our eating, eating quality, okay? So it depends on how this goes. You know, if we said uh, pre-waning right now, we're not gonna, we're gonna let our carbs grow slower because our commodity prices are very high. Um, sorry about that, just move back on that one. Um, the only time this would really be a profitable option compared to the normal is, is when our commodity prices are very high and we can't afford to um, feed our cows or early wane. Um, and that would be, mean that, um, and that, that is for a breeding system, sorry. And, and whereas if you're a feedlotter, you'd say, right, I, I might be able to capture some of that compensatory gain at a later stage. So that's slower pre-weaning growth. Let's have a look at a growth restriction around weaning. And these are animals that are finished on pasture and not in a feedlot. So let's say we have a growth restriction around weaning and a couple of months after weaning, we are 143 kilos down on where we should be or where we'd like to be. What you can see again here is we have big, big blocks. So this is like the uh, CRC trial I showed earlier where they start losing weight. Yep, they will catch up for a period of time, but they never completely catch up. And you end up having that difference like we went through earlier of about 50 kilos less at slaughter. So we'll get some compensation but not complete compensation. So that's where it's really important that we at least keep some sort of growth going in our weaners immediately post weaning. And finally, out of all these, um, I'll just show you a few charts of when we have a slower post weaning growth. Um, let's say we have a season where we wean our animals in uh, January or February and we're just starting to run out of a bit of grass and our commodity prices are quite high. And so we're unable to uh, feed these animals as much as we'd like to, to maximise their growth rate at uh, 0.7 kilos per day. And we end up feeding them to a ration of say 0.6 kilos per day, average daily gain, okay? And so that's, that's during that post weaning period until they hit the finishing stage. So until they're sold as feeders. And what we can see here is, uh, is we do slow down their rate of gain. So we absolutely slow it down. You know, we're, we're slowing down for this entire post weaning period until feedlot entry or until finishing on pasture entry. Um, and what this does here is it doesn't delay the weight. It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean you never reach that weight, it just delays the weight. And this is a really tough one to measure, but we'll go into it a bit later. It's looking at the cost of holding these animals for an extra period of time where they're growing at 0.6 rather than 0.7 kilos per day. And then we get a massive slug in compensatory gain here, okay? So questions to ask you there are, what's our commodity price? And does it mean that we can't afford to feed to these levels here? And is it gonna be a non-profitable exercise if we feed to 0.7 kilos per day? Um, what's our target market? If we're finishing ourselves, well, 
whoop de doo we'll still hit, we'll get that compensator again in this finishing stage. And so we'll actually hit our finishing weight at the same age without any supplementary feed. We've just had our spring flush here, or we've just put them into our feedlot here, and they're growing like rockets, okay? So all this money we would have spent on feeding these guys here to maintain this growth rate, we end up at the same point at the same time. Whereas here, if we're selling them here as feeders, we've just got to weigh up the risk of how much is it going to cost us to sell to feed these guys extra, and how much is it going to cost us to hold them for the extra period of time until we can sell them into a feeder market, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So that's on steers. So depending on your commodity prices, and we'll go through this a little bit later, but depending on your commodity prices, it can be profitable to feed them at a high rate, um, particularly at the moment where your sale price is really quite high. Um, however, if you, if you don't have the pressure on your stocking rates there, you can actually save yourself money by holding them for the extra period. Just a little bit now on, on, on formulating rations and what's the best ration, okay? So what is the best ration? Well, this really varies significantly season by season. It depends on our rainfall, depends on our pasture availability and the quality of our pasture. And it also depends on whether we're conservatively stocked or heavy stocked, we're running animals hard. And that comes down to, do we need to provide a partial supplement in paddocks or do we have to provide a full, full supplement in a feedlot type situation? One of the biggest things, I do do quite a bit of ration formulation for, for my clients, and the biggest thing I'd say is don't get caught up in the additives and fairy dust and things like that. The main things you really want to prioritise are hitting that crude protein target and hitting that metabolizable energy target. If either your crude protein or your energy is limiting, we're not going to hit our full performance and we're not going to hit our growth rates that we want. So really just keep it simple. We have two main priorities of protein and energy. And you can see here why that's so important. Okay, so we've got a table here, which let's say we have a 200 kilo steer, which we want to grow at 500 grams per day, so 0.5 a kilo. Now, the most this animal can physically eat is gonna be 5.5 kilos per day, okay? So that's all it can eat, five and a half kilos per day. Now the minimum, to, to have this animal growing at half a kilo per day, the minimum metabolizable energy we require is eight megajoules of metabolizable energy per kilo of dry matter, okay? And that's just a simple calculation of saying eight times 5.5 equals 44, okay? And our minimum crude protein percentage is 12%, okay? To hit this target weight. If I have a supplement that has seven megajoules of energy and 14% crude protein, I'm effectively wasting the money on the extra protein, okay? Because we can only utilize enough protein up to seven megajoules of energy. Same again, if I have a supplement that's 10 megajoules of energy and I've only got 6% protein, I'm only gonna utilize enough protein uh, and energy for 6% for of protein, okay? So it means our growth rates are gonna be really slow if we're deficient in one or the other. So we can use this chart to drive how we feed. So I can say, right, hey, I wanna have a 300 kilo steer growing at half a kilo per day. I'm gonna need seven and a half megajoules of metabolizable energy per day and 10% protein. That's what I need in my total diet, okay? So when we're formulating diets, this is the most important thing. Um, and the best suited commodities are gonna be those that provide these, provide these uh, the, the energy and the protein in the cheapest form effectively. Must be palatable, of course, and be able to be eaten by the stock. But the best suited commodities are gonna be those which are gonna provide those in the cheapest form. One point I would add here is something I often get asked is, uh, can we use silage or hay alone on, on rank and, and dry pasture with uh, poor digestibility to hit our growth rates on um, in, in cattle and in weaners? And effectively, silage or hay alone is most of the time insufficient for high growth rates, even if it's of exceptional quality. Um, and that's purely because these animals have a restricted intake. They can only eat five and a half kilos a day for a 200 kilo steer. And so we just can't eat enough energy and protein to maintain our growth rates. And again, as I said before, focus on meeting that uh, energy and crude protein level and that will give us our least cost per kilogram of live weight gain, okay? 
So just quickly, I've just run a couple of examples here through uh, through GrassFeed. Um, and this is probably a typical Western Districts of Victoria example. Um, we've got 1.2 tonne of dry matter per hectare, standing dry feed, so around about four centimetres high, good coverage. And we're in March, we've got no green pick, um, which is a bit different for this year. And if we just put wieners alone on this, so 200 kilo wieners alone on this, we'd be losing just under one and a half kilos per day if we gave them no supplement. So then I ran some options through grass feed where I said, all right, let's feed them just silage, okay? And this is high quality silage. We've got decent crude protein, we've got decent energy in it, but I want to hit 400 grams per day average daily gain. So what we'll find is that I can't actually fit enough silage into them to get that weight gain. We're on about 220 grams per day. I can't fit enough silage, I can't fit enough supplement into them to hit that weight gain, okay? That supplement cost here is around about $1.32 per head, okay, to hit this. So let's say we could double that and we could get our weight gain and we could get enough silage into this animal to hit 400 grams per day. Let's say we'll need double the supplement if they could take it in. That would cost us $2.60 per day. This is just for comparison to a commercial pellet down here, which let's say it costs 477 bucks a tonne. Has a pretty decent energy rating, 11 and 16% crude protein. This is actually from a from a true commercial pellet. I think they've probably overdone it a bit on the uh, crude protein level here, and probably gone a little bit high for a wiener. But what we can see here is, yep, we can hit our 400 grams per day average daily gain. Absolutely, no worries. And we're feeding about four kilos of supplement per day, as opposed to 4.5. Okay. Now the cost of this to hit our 400 grams a day is $2.32 a head, okay? Compared to this, where if we could force enough down their throats, force enough silage down their throats to hit our 400 grams per day, we're gonna be about $2.60 per head. So in this situation, even if we could get enough silage into them, it's gonna cost us more than a commercial pellet, which is typically at the upper end of, uh, of costs in supplements. And then I just did a simple run, just looking at feeding silage and oats. Um, and this was feeding around about uh, 950 grams a day of, of oats and, and 3.8 kilos of silage. And we can actually uh, do this and hit our weight gain of 400 grams per day. Uh, and so 400 grams per day here at $1.74 per head. So again, we come in about 30% cheaper than our commercial fella. One thing I often get asked is, should we be processing uh, cereal grains for weaners and things like that? And absolutely, older stock, they do need processing of grains to utilise it efficiently. You know, um, that's older cattle. Um, otherwise, we do tend to get a bit of wastage and, and underutilise starch. However, there's very little benefit in actually processing cereal grains for uh, steers and, and heifers that are under 10 months of age. And generally, the actual cost of processing the grain for steers and heifers under 10 months of age outweighs the cost of, um, outweighs the benefit of, uh, of the additional um, soluble carbohydrate. Okay. So just quickly on this ration stuff, know your target. So what sort of average daily gain do we want to hit? Now we're going to be pushing our steers hard or are we looking for heifers? Know where our pasture's at. So what's our height? Do we have standing dry feed? How many tonnes of dry matter per hectare? And do we have a fresh grain pick there, which is going to increase our digestibility and quality a lot? The other thing is hay and silage alone to hit our growth rates won't cut it for growth in weaners. We'll lose money and lose weight. And your ideal supplement is going to vary from year to year um, on commodity prices, but match it to crude protein and metabolizable energy. So just I had an email the other day from uh, Michael Carroll who sent me uh, some interesting data around this and he's kindly agreed to let me use this data um, in this presentation. And this was some data collected from a Southwest Victoria beef producer who uh, split um, 240 weaners into three groups of weaning. And um, what, we, what we split them into was 100 heavier steers and 100 heavier heifers. And then just drafted off the lightest, uh, lightest 40 steers and heifers. And these, these were lighter calves and weaners, mainly because they were late, uh, late calves out of heifers, um, with the odd twin and the odd sort of uh, health setback uh, contributing to the lighter mob. So the herd was a spring calving herd. Post weaning, they were weaned onto a, uh, uh, weaned onto a dry standing feed effectively. Um, the heavy calves were fed on a homegrown silage. Um, 
there was a little bit of grain kicking the feet, I believe, and a lot of calves were fed on a commercial pellet. Okay. So this chart just here is a chart of the uh, body weights at, uh, at weaning on, uh, uh, on the 1st of February in 2019. Okay, we can see that's where we start. And we can see there that, um, that our lighter calves were about, the uh, lighter steers were about 28% less at weaning than the rest of the mob. And the lighter heifers were about 25% uh, less in weight than the rest of the mob, okay? And uh, what we did is we, we supplementary fed them on, uh, on our pellets um, until the 4th of June, which we can see just here, okay? So until the 4th of June. So these light guys were fed supplementary feed on, on pellets up until here. These guys, a bit heavier, we're just giving their silage and green pick just to maintain a steady growth rate um, until until June, until we stopped feeding at all, because at this stage we had enough uh, enough quality pasture on the ground. Okay. Interestingly, at this waypoint here, uh, our lights did actually weighed three percent more, and our heifers five percent more than their counterparts. Okay. Um, and then we we just put them all out and mix them back in a group together, and by the end of October here. No, effectively at similar weights, okay? So effectively at similar weights. So that gap was effectively closed. Now, what I would say here is I'd love to see a negative control in this environment here, where these, a portion of these guys were just fed um, on the silage rather than the pellet, and just see how their growth rate tracks up until June, and then how they take off after June when they're on a better pasture, okay? And just looking at the costs around this, uh, you can see here that the pellets, despite being 477 bucks a ton, um, they were eating about 4.4 kilos per day and gaining around about 1.1 kilograms per day, okay, with a, with a uh, 5.7 to 1 uh, feed conversion. Now that's, um, that's, that's including the, uh, the supplementary feed in this, okay. So then we have a look at the silage and we see we're gaining around about 300 grams per day. We've only got a 13 to 1 feed conversion. So for every one kilo of live weight gain, we need to eat 13 kilos of silage. So it's pretty hard work, okay? Which then we translate it, and this is where I was going into the importance of costing your rations on uh, energy and on protein, is you look at the cost per live weight gain here for the pellets. The pellets cost 477 bucks a tonne. The silage cost 177 bucks a tonne, and that's per tonne of dry matter, okay? Uh, per tonne as fed, it's about 120 bucks. So much more expensive feed. You're looking at about two and a half times the cost per tonne. But because they had the uh, energy and protein matched up properly, we're looking at around about $2.70 per kilo live weight um, uh, as, the, as the cost of gain here, compared to $2.91 for the silage. So we weigh that up and we said, all right, let's say we sold these animals in, uh, in, in, in June, once we took the supplementary feed away, was it worth it? Pretty high pellet price there, 477 bucks and reasonably high silage price as well because of the season. But based on current markets, it actually is beneficial if we were gonna sell them in June to feed these guys at a higher rate and really push them through, okay? So, this is effectively just a quick summary of, uh, of what I've said. Um, you can see here that the compensation, let's say we missed out on 40 kilos of growth rate because uh, that was based on our 80% compensation. We would have had a reduced income of 132 heads per steer, okay? Whereas if we lose, if we look at the uh, cost per kilogram of live weight gain of the pellets, around about 276, I think it was 271, and assume the additional 40 kilograms gain, we're looking at around about $110.40 in costs and, um, and based on market price at the time, around about $3.30. Um, it was about a return on the investment of about 20%. Okay, so not a massive return, but reasonably high. And that's the same slide again. At the price when these were sold, at $2.70 or $2.91 for silage per kilo gain. We can compare it to current markets. We can see, yep, when these guys would have been sold, absolutely worth it. But at this time here, if we said it cost us $2.70 for those extra kilos, it wouldn't have been worth it when the price is around about $2.40 per kilo live weight, okay? So just to finish up now, and, and I do apologize, that was a lot of information to go through in a short period of time. Um, but for steers, 
at the current market and commodity prices, um, there is a demonstrable effect um, and a benefit uh, to pushing them hard and providing sufficient supplementary feed to them from weaning to sale, that feed away. If you're gonna if you're gonna have restricted feed, if you're feeding your finishing your own animals, then maintaining a relatively stable growth rate is is helpful. But you don't need to push them in that grower phase because when you put them into the finisher phase, they'll actually catch up and they'll compensate, like we saw in those charts from the BCRC. So if we're finishing our own, we can go a little bit easier when we're growing them out. Just do the maths. So estimate the cost of supplementary feeding before taking it on. Some of it seems quite complex. It's actually a lot of this stuff can be done with rough estimates on the back of the envelope sort of thing. Also, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Like with that case study there, you can supplementary feed the lighter portion to allow them to catch up. The other thing is knowing your farm, knowing your operation and your time of feed restriction and the time of feed limitation is really important. Um, the later it is, so let's say this occurs in animals at eight months of age for two months, as opposed to three months of age for two months the quicker it is the animals will compensate when they come onto a, onto a higher energy and higher protein ration. And know your target market. If you're spring calving and you're selling wainers and villas, don't look to utilise compensatory gain. You can't let them lose weight because you're going to be sold by the time we get a green flush of feed the next year. But if we're selling feeders or finishing ourselves, we can utilise it a little bit, a little bit strategically to achieve higher margins because it then reduces our cost of production. For heifers, you can just let them cruise along. Post weaning setbacks and checks in growths don't really compromise reproductive performance. Some growth is still necessary um, because our age of puberty is strongly dependent on body weight. We need to hit 60% of our mature body weight. But what I would say is yes, our heifers can be run a little bit harder than our steers. Let's prioritise our feeding of steers above the heifers. Um, we just need our heifers to have that steady growth rate. Steers, at the moment on commodity prices, and market prices, we're going to be uh, we're, we're going to be getting our money back on. And in drought years, just going back on what I touched on briefly there, um, to maintain growth of your weaners, consider early weaning. Um, it'll reduce your weaner setback, allow for more efficient utilisation of your resources. So just thinking that uh, growth of a weaner and a dry cow, maintaining a dry cow takes less energy than a lactating dry cow and a calf on it. And this will also this early weaning reduce your cow body condition score loss and that's improve your subsequent reproductive performance, okay? So early weaning is a tool there which can really help you out in times when, you, when you're starting to hit a few dry periods. Anyway, that's all from me. Um, sorry, it was such a rushed presentation. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, I think, um, I think Courtney can come back on the line now too, so. Thanks, Ben, that was great. Um, it's really good insight into what um, we should be targeting and what are the different um, things that will influence the results um, of our weight gains in weaners. So um, thank you for that. Before we get into any questions, I'm aware that some of you might have to take off early. And if you do, I just ask that you please fill in the survey as you exit the webinar. Um, this survey is shared with MLA and the presenters to help improve extension efforts and make sure that we're top, um, targeting the right topics. So um, we have a few questions written in, but if anybody else would like to um, submit a few, please do. So Meg has asked, this was back um, when you were talking about the, the graph from the BCRC, I think. Meg asked, what about the genetic influence um, with the low birth weights but high um, EBV growth rates? How does that influence? Yeah, so so most of the work, there hasn't been much work done on that, but effectively most of the work that's been done looking at that reduced birth weight is, is 10 kilograms behind uh, below your standard birth weight, okay? So it's not necessarily applicable to, uh, say, differences in genetics and differences between breeds. It's more applicable to that breed type, that bloodline. If we're 10 percent, uh, 10 kilos below where we should be, we tend to have compromised performance. So. Um, particularly in heifers, you know, using low birth weight and bulls and bulls with low birth weight EBVs is, is a really important way to um, uh, to reduce carving issues in your heifers. Um, that's, a, that's a slightly different thing. And that's, that's, that's a genetic defect which won't compromise your growth rate later from those lower birth weight animals. It's more to do with the feed restriction that then puts you 10 kilos below your anticipated birth weight, if that makes sense. Yes, okay, yeah, thanks, Ben. 
Um, another question just about um, mentioning the energy, protein and NDF values in the supplementary feed um, rations. Is it true that silage with a low NDF, high energy and protein is just as good as, if not better than, supplementary feeding with grain? Uh, look, if you've got decent quality pasture, then um, then it can be a good source of protein silage. However, generally, unless you've got seriously exceptional quality uh, silage, um, it just doesn't have enough energy and then allow for enough intake per day in weaners um, to be able to keep those growth rates up there. And that's where the energy density of cereal grains and things like that in combination with silage can really help you hit your um, hit your targets uh, a lot better and hit your growth rate targets at a cheaper price as well. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Ben. Um, another question. Would grass feed have projected better growth um, than 0 0.3 kilograms per head per day on the silage in the Carol example? Is it the 3% protein making all the weight gain difference between pellets and silage? Uh, yes, that would be the difference there. Yeah. I, no, actually, I think the, sorry, I, I think the uh, silage, I'll just pull that up again. If we have a look at the, um, so the silage was 11.2 uh, megs of metabolizable energy. Now, I think for those wieners, I think they're relatively light. And we were just giving a little bit under what they needed in terms of energy. So it was a very slight energy deficiency, and that just meant we couldn't hit our, couldn't hit as high a um, growth rate as we could with the uh, higher protein and higher energy ME. Yeah, that pellet, sorry. Yep. Yep, all right. Um, just going back to a previous slide, somebody's um, queried, you compared the cost of pellets as fed and the cost of silage per tonne of dry matter. Shouldn't the cost of these be assessed both based on dry matter or both based on as fed? I think we're looking uh, back here. Um, those cost of pellets were were as uh, were per ton of dry matter. Sorry. Ah, oh, great. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Um, a uh, question from Neil, could you use whole barley on spring wieners in autumn and get good growth rates? Uh, it, it is an option, however, it need to be combined with another protein source um, because whole barley has quite high and a really useful high uh, energy value in it, but generally doesn't have high enough uh, crude protein. Generally, it's only got about 8% crude protein. Um, so that's where we can utilise and can run this in a mix of, say, feeding 70% uh, uh, barley and 30% and silage or vice versa, and then making sure we've got that extra protein in the silage that we can feed with the barley. So we hit both our crude protein and our energy levels. Yep. All right. Thanks, Ben. I have a question on compensatory gain. What What's the maximum average daily gain that has been seen in compensatory gain um, examples that's realistic and how can we maximise this yeah. when it's... That, um, excellent question actually because that is uh, that is an area that we don't know and we find really hard to measure. Yeah. Um, there's some situations where we where trials have been set up and they've gone that we'll, we anticipate compensatory gain in these animals um, but it just doesn't happen. There's a whole lot of factors that underlie that. Um, that the compensatory gain factor that, that we just don't know about yet. So we know that compensatory gain can and does occur and can even be accelerated rates, you know, up to 20 to 25% higher than we'd anticipate. Um, but we just don't know how we can predict that in, in individual animals at the moment. Okay, oh, that's interesting. So, um, so more, more work needed in that area, I'd say. Yep, yep. Um, so in Western, uh, Sorry, a question from Guy. In Western Queensland, we often use either pellets or inner grain mix to supplement early weaning. Is there any difference at the same protein and energy? So any uh, it'd probably come, it'd, it'd come down to your efficiency of starch utilisation. Um, and that would be if there is a, if there is a, uh, a minor improvement in, in, your, in cracking grain in a pellet and things like that. Um, compared to just feeding whole grains of the same value, 
it comes down to how efficiently the starch is utilised and, and typically the pellet will um, have more utilisable starch, if that makes sense. So you'll see better, better gain out of the pellet than the barley. So that's where a processing benefit, if you're not paying for it yourself, um, the, the benefit of processing grains into a pellet and things like that can pay off. Okay, in terms of making um, it more available to be digested. Yep, correct. Okay. Um, another question, are we simplifying crude protein too much? We've seen some interesting results with canola meal, i.e. increased FCR, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that acronym means, compared to... No, feed conversion ratio. Oh, yeah. great, thank you. Compared, compared to what grass feed modelled, what um, might be protein quality rather than crude protein alone? Yep, so there's there's different things which um, we are finding more about, which is, um, you know, coming down to individual amino acid constituents in feed. Um, and then obviously bypass protein as well, which is um, pure protein that bypasses the rumen and then goes straight into the straight into the um, absorption by the animal. Um, look, yes, I think we are oversimplifying to a degree, and, and there is more to it than that. However, the basic fundamentals, which gets you 95% of the way, are around metabolizable energy and crude protein levels, and that gives you the biggest bang for your buck and the biggest response. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, do we consider carving ease when talking about reproductive performance, considering um, heifer growth path and subsequent reproduction performance? Yep, and uh, that's where I reckon I'll just find back uh, the data from the Struan trial that was undertaken in South Australia that I, I sort of shot through relatively quickly, which apologise for that. But um, what we did notice in that trial was that earlier, more rapid growth in the animals uh, did lead to less dissocial. So if we had good pre-weaning um, nutrition in our heifers when they're calves, we had less issues with um, calves getting stuck in dystocia compared to calves that were really quite constricted and, and had quite restricted growth rates pre-weaning. So let's say calves in a drought situation. And we do see that on some of the clients' properties, which have been through drought in the last few years, where calves probably didn't grow as fast as we wanted them to pre-weaning. We are starting to see now, as they're calving down as heifers, uh, more incidences of, um, of calves being stuck. So yeah, absolutely, it, it is an important factor to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, Colin asks, when is silage useful? Yep, so it can be useful, um, like I was saying before, as, a, as an additive. Um, let's say we, we mix it in with barley and, and silage, um, or, or not necessarily mixed in, but fed alongside. Um, and it can be a useful way of maintaining condition on our, on our um, mature cows as well, as a useful feed supplement. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, does, the res does restriction of growth in young heifers affect their pelvic development? Uh, yeah, and that's that's similar to the last question we just went through on the dystocia as well. Uh, I believe that um, if we do have compromised pre-weaning nutrition, so pre-weaning restriction, then that can restrict our pelvic development and, and our pelvic area, um, which then makes it uh, more likely that we're going to have issues with with calving um, compared to heifers that are fed well. So it's a bit of a bit of a balance with heifers there as far as pre-weaning nutrition goes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question about, again, um, average daily gain. When, um, so if we're talking about a 600 gram average daily gain, is every gain above that marginal, is that easier to achieve than the initial 600 grams? No, the initial 600 is the easiest to achieve. Right, okay. um, yeah, yeah. The, the the harder we try and push our average daily gain, the more energy we have to put into it. Um, and that's because as animals, uh, cattle are really efficient at putting um, at putting their energy into just maintenance. So um, so, so maintaining their body condition, um, maintaining their metabolism, things like that. Uh, but as soon as we start, the harder we try and push them and get them to grow, the more we have to feed. So it's a bit of an exponential response actually. Um, that that once we once we start pushing them really hard and trying to accelerate really high gains, our efficiency of gain is lower. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Great, that's interesting. Um, that's all for our questions that have been written in. Greg has asked, do we get a copy of all these slides? Um, not so much the slides, but the entire presentation, the recorded version of the slides will be put on the MLA website. Um, that usually happens pretty quickly, but if you're really keen to get them tomorrow, just feel free to email me um, or Hillary. I'm sure you have her contact details on the webinar um, platform website and we'll be happy to forward that on to you. All right, well, thank you for your time tonight, Ben. That was, that was great. Just for everybody else to let you know, the next webinar will be next Tuesday night and that's on drench resistance in cattle with John Webware and you'll receive more information about that via email. So hopefully you can make it to that. Thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight and please take the time to fill out the survey as you exit. Thanks again for your time, Ben. Um, Thank you. Great.